We've already looked at the nervous system and now we're going to move on and look at the hormonal or endocrine system which works alongside the nervous system to detect and respond to changes in the internal and the external environment. Before we move on and look at that in more detail, just pause the video and think about some things that a body might need to respond to both internally and externally. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to think about that. So I've got a few examples here. So internally, your body will need to check and respond to the level of uh, concentration of um, glucose in the blood. It will constantly be monitoring and adjusting for the internal temperature, for the water potential and for pH changes that may be occurring in cells. Externally, your body will have to detect and make um, changes if there is a movement, a sudden movement, um, if the temperature externally changes, if there's a change in light intensity, or for instance, if there's a new or loud sudden sound. So your hormonal system is made up of a group of glands called endocrine glands, which secrete hormones. And what is a hormone is quite a common A-level question. It's usually worth three or four marks. So I've put down here um, parts of the definition that you need to include. So hormones are chemical messengers. They are made in one part of the body and they move to target cells. And it is only those cells that are affected. So those cells are specific and at that point there, we have a response. Hormones are usually long lasting and in animals, hormones are secreted directly into the bloodstream. Usually um, chemicals that are secreted in the body pass down little tubes called ducts, but hormones are always secreted directly into the bloodstream and they travel around the body in blood plasma. Now, hormones can be made of a variety of different chemicals, including steroids, proteins, glycoproteins, amines or tyrosine, tyrosine derivatives. Tyrosine is a type of amino acid and a derivative means that it, it, its starting point was tyrosine. It's made from um, initially tyrosine. So another good thing that I'd like you to have a look at now is just to compare information or how the endocrine system and the nervous system works. Um, in an A-level question, if they ask for a comparison, you have to write both sides of the argument. You can't just say, for my first example here, that um, hormonal system, the response is slow. That would not get you a mark. You'd have to say, in the hormonal system, the response is slow, but it is rapid in the nervous system. So you always have to give both sides in a comparison list. So pause the video now, have a little think, see what you can come up with. So here are some suggested differences. And if this were um, an A-level exam, then I would realistically want to write down probably about four or five of these in an answer. So as long as you can remember four or five of them, then that's fine. So let's look at those differences. Hormonal system, the chemicals involved, or the communication is by chemicals called hormones. In the nervous system, it's obviously by nervous impulses. Electrical impulses would be a better answer to put in there. Transmission is by the blood system. And again, I think I would put blood plasma in there rather than just blood system and the nervous system obviously by neurons hormonal system relatively slow nervous system very rapid um, hormonal system only the target organs respond um, but it travels around the whole body the chemicals are in the blood plasma they're traveling around everywhere but only the target cells within those target organs respond whereas nerve impulses are much more specific and only go to one particular part of the body the response is widespread response is localized hormonal system slow generally nervous system rapid generally um, hormonal usually long-lasting 
nervous system usually short-lived and with the hormonal, hormonal system the effect may be permanent and irreversible but usually with the nervous system it's temporary and reversible and it's good to put usually in your answers to these because they're often exceptions so it isn't always the case. So you will have studied endocrine glands at GCSE, um, but what I want you to have a look at now is to see if you can remember the names of any of the glands, the hormones that each gland may release, and then try and remember the function of each one of those hormones. Pause the video and sketch this out on a piece of paper. So let's have a look at these answers. Uh, before we do that, I've put the name of three glands at the top of this slide, the pituitary gland, the pancreas and the adrenal glands. And those are three that we are going to be looking at in more detail over the next few weeks. The other glands, realistically, we're not going to cover in more detail. However, you will need to know the names of the glands, the hormones they produce and what those hormones are used for. OK, so let's look through these answers. The first gland is called the pineal gland and that is in your brain and that produces the hormone melatonin. Now melatonin is the hormone that's used um, as part of reproductive development and also in your daily cycles. So your daily cycles um, means when you get tired and sleepy and ready for bed or when you're alert normally first thing in the morning. And so this is the hormone that causes us trouble when we go abroad and we enter a different time zone and we suffer from jet lag because although the sun might come up, your body is still um, adjusting the melatonin levels and therefore you might be feeling sleepy. The second endocrine gland is the thymus and that produces thymosin, which is um, involved in the production and maturation of white blood cells, uh, T cells, because they pass through the thymus. The third, the third gland here is the pancreas and that produces two hormones, insulin, which converts glucose to glycogen and glucagon, which converts glycogen to glucose. In females, we have the ovaries and the ovaries produce oestrogen and progesterone. Oestrogen um, is used to thicken the uterus lining and progesterone is produced once um, the egg has been released from the ovary from the scar tissue left behind remember called the corpus luteum and that progesterone um, sort of readies the uterus for the arrival of the fertilized egg. In males we have the testes and they obviously produce testosterone which um, is used for sperm production and secondary sexual characteristics in males. We then have the adrenal glands which are just on top of each of the kidneys and they produce adrenaline and adrenaline is often referred to as your fight or flight hormone and um, obviously if you're getting yourself ready to run away or to fight off uh, like a an approaching bear for instance um, and that's so that's going to increase your heart and your breathing rate it's going to raise your blood sugar level basically so that you can increase respiration and either run away or fight then you've got your thyroid gland which looks a bit like a bow tie in your neck that produces thyroxine that one controls your metabolic rate and then finally, in your brain, you have the pituitary gland and your pituitary gland is often referred to as the master gland because it um, controls quite a lot of the activity within the other glands in your body. It also produces its own hormones, including growth hormone, which obviously uh, leads to growth, antidiuretic hormone, which we will look at in a bit more detail when we talk about the kidneys, and that involves... Um, or increases water absorption in the kidney, so it, it helps to maintain uh, the water potential in your blood plasma. And your pituitary gland also releases gonadotrophins, which are involved in the development of the ovaries and the testes. So let's look at the pituitary gland in a little bit more detail. Um, if you've forgotten this, it might be worth going back and looking through uh, the brain video that we did a few weeks ago.
So here you can see the uh, pituitary gland is split into two halves. Remember it's about the same, the size of a pea, and there's the hypothalamus sitting on top of it. So you have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary produces um, about six hormones and it includes FSH. Remember FSH is follicle stimulating hormone and that's the one that's responsible for stimulating um, the egg follicles within the ovaries in females. You've got the posterior pituitary which then stores and releases those hormones that have been produced by the hypothalamus. So ADH is an example of one that has been produced and released by the hypothalamus but stored within the posterior pituitary. Before we go on to look at how hormones interact with their target cells, we'll just remind ourselves of the correct order of hormone action. So have a look at these statements and jot them down on a piece of paper in the correct order. If you pause the video now and then I'll tell you the answers in a second. Okay, so the answers. So the first thing obviously is that the environment is going to change and that could be either the internal or the external environment. That triggers the release of hormone from a particular endocrine gland. That hormone then travels all over the body in the blood plasma. Once it reaches the target cells, the hormone diffuses out of the blood and will bind to specific, specific receptors within that target cell. Now that might be on the cell membrane or it might be in the cytoplasm of the cell itself. And then those target cells are stimulated to produce a response. So looking at that in a little bit more detail, we can divide our hormones into two groups. We've got steroid hormones, which are lipid soluble. So they're able to pass through that lipid bilayer. An example of that one, for instance, would be the female hormone estrogen. And then we have non-steroid hormones, which are hydrophilic. So they cannot normally pass through that lipid bilayer. An example of that would be adrenaline. Now, I've put this picture up. I really like this as a good summary to explain um, or, or show which materials are able to pass through that lipid bilayer. Um, when you do your A-level exam, knowing information like this is really important. Um, the movement of materials across lipid bilayers comes up quite a lot. So this is a good thing to, to make sure that you've learnt. So we've got our hydrophobic molecules. So that would be like our steroid hormones in this example, our, our um, estrogen. So that can obviously pass through. Then we've got small uncharged polar molecules, which can get through that because they're so small. Things like water, urea, ethanol. We've got our large uncharged polar molecules, which would in this instant be our non-steroid hormones like adrenaline that can't get through. And then we have our ions again, which can't get through. And remember that when we have molecules that can't pass through the membrane, we have to have protein channels for them to be able to pass through. So looking at those steroid hormones first, these ones, remember, are hydrophobic they are lipid soluble. So they are able to pass through that lipid bilayer. Um, so hormones, for example, estrogen, they are released from the ovaries. They will travel in the blood plasma to the cells, to the target cells. And once they reach those target cells, they will be able to pass through that cell membrane. And so at the top of this diagram here, that purple kind of shape on the outside of the cell, that's representing that lipid soluble steroid hormone which can move through the membrane. Once it gets through that membrane it's going to attach to a receptor protein somewhere in the cytoplasm. It could be in the nucleus uh, but usually within the cytoplasm. That then forms a receptor or, or hormone receptor complex molecule. Okay, that hormone receptor complex molecule can then attach to the DNA. And once it attaches to the DNA, it can either uh, trigger and facilitate transcription of a particular gene, or it can inhibit and stop transcription of a particular gene. Okay, so if we are triggering um, or facilitating 
uh, transcription of a particular gene. What that means is that we are then being able to produce mRNA. That mRNA can then be translated into a particular protein um, on the ribosomes. So looking at a non-steroid hormone, we're talking here about hormones which are hydrophilic and unable to pass through that uh, plasma membrane. So an example obviously would be adrenaline. So what happens here is that the hormone, which we refer to as the first messenger, is going to be complementary to a receptor site on the outside of that cell surface membrane. And they are going to fit together to form a hormone receptor complex. And when that hormone attaches to the receptor to form the complex, it actually activates an enzyme which is sitting on the inside of that cell surface membrane. That enzyme then um, converts, in this instance, ATP into CAMP, uh, which is referred to as our second messenger. CAMP stands for cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And then that can go off and then activate other enzymes and we get our response. So let's look at it in terms of adrenaline, which is the example you need to know. So adrenaline is our hormone. It's the first messenger. It fits into that complementary receptor site to form the adrenaline receptor complex. And as it does that, it converts that inactive form of adenylcyclase into the active form of adenylcyclase. That adenylcyclase is sitting on the inside of that cell surface membrane. It converts ATP into CAMP, which is our um, second messenger, and then that activates enzymes called protein kinases, which phosphorylate and activates other enzymes. Phosphorylate means the addition of a phosphate group, and by doing that, it converts the enzyme from its inactive to its active form. So the enzymes that are going to be involved are those that are going to convert glycogen into glucose. And remember that process of converting glycogen into glucose is called glycogenolysis. Now, you can also say it as glycogen lysis. Lysis means cutting. So we're cutting that glycogen up into glucose.